But the thing that that I, I emphasize when I talk particularly to newly diagnosed young type one diabetics is the importance, the benefits, the, the transformative power of daily exercise. Welcome back to the Sign of Good Health podcast. Today, I'm talking with George Mallet. He has type one diabetes and he's also a father, a cowboy, and the father of a cowboy <laughs> and an artist and a news anchor. He's kind of a Renaissance man. <laughs> So. I like that term, Renaissance man. I'll go with that. <laughs> um, yeah, it's been it's it's funny, you know. You um, in in your own mind, you, you know, I, I I still feel like I'm I'm still um, like it 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 still feels like something new to me, diabetes, because I guess it was such a shock when I was diagnosed, um, and I was 17 years old. Oh wow, that um, seems late. Yeah. Well, it not really. Um, I, I'm learning as time goes on that um, it, it does happen. Um, um, I mean, the autoimmune system can attack the pancreas really at any time. I met a guy um, a couple of years ago who ha is a type one diabetic, but he got it in his 60s. And, you know, I, I mean, obviously that's rare, but you know, it's usually a childhood thing. But um, 17 was not... Uh, all that late. I think Mary Tyler Moore was in her 20s when she got type 1 diabetes. So, but, um, but boy, what a transformation uh, in the in the treatment of type 1 diabetes in the, you know, what 40, 40 plus years that I've had it. Um, you know, when I, when I was diagnosed, um, home glucose testing wasn't even a thing. Um, and you would you would pee in a cup and test it with a strip, like a dip strip, to see if you were spilling over sugar in your urine. Yeah, um, I do remember reading about like that. That was back in the day. Like they would taste test even just to see if it was sweet. Mm -hmm. um, and so, and and really, all that told you was that you had reached a really high level of blood sugar hours earlier, um, mm -hmm. to the point where it was spilling over. Um, you know, so, so the big breakthroughs in my life have been probably, first of all, home glucose testing. And, and I was, uh, I was kind of late to the, late to the game on that. Um, and then, um, and then later on the longer acting insulin. So, um, before I got on an insulin pump, um, I would take a single shot of, of, uh, a long acting ultra lenti insulin. And, and then I would take subsequent shots every time I ate a regular insulin to account for the carbohydrates that I was eating at a particular meal. Um, and, but I want to say I did, I did so many of those things, um, probably not as well as I should have, but the thing that, that I, I emphasize when I talk particularly to newly diagnosed young type one diabetics is the importance, the benefits, the, the transformative power of daily exercise, because that was the one thing that um, I, I was diagnosed in 1978. And within a few months, I took up long distance running. And I don't recommend long distance running because when you get to be a guy my age, your knees feel the effects of it. But, um, but the good thing about it was it was really great for my cardiovascular system and my circulation and all the things that are impacted by type one diabetes. Um, and I've been absolutely a zealot about that my entire life. I, um, was that pre-diabetes too, or just, no, it was not, it was, I mean, you know, I, um, I ran track in, uh, like junior high school, but I, I was not a fitness nut. Um, and I did, um, you know, I, I went through a phase where I was obsessed with Bruce Lee and working out all the time and uh, doing uh, martial arts and Taekwondo, but um, it really, that, that diagnosis scared me enough uh, that, um, so there was a psychological benefit to working out every day and seeing the impact on my, my fitness. And um, so, so I, you know, I, it, it started off with long distance running. I did that well into my well into my 40, even my 50s, I, I was, you know, I, I think I ran my last, um, I ran my last 5k probably when I was in my mid 50s. Um, and I did that 5k in 24 minutes. 
So, wow. um, but, um, and I trained for that by doing nothing but the elliptical trainer. <laughs> so, because I was trying to save my knees, but that's what I do now. I, uh, at some point, probably in my fifties, I went entirely bicycle elliptical trainer. And then of course, uh, I, I started doing strength training. You know, I, I feel like running is, is great for your heart and your circulatory system. It is very hard on your body and, and actually breaks your body down more than it builds it up. So um, in my late 30s, I started to supplement my cardio with, with strength training. You know, just you know, like, you know, 30 pull-ups a day and, you know, 100 sit-ups and either getting a bench press or, or push-ups and tricep extensions and stretching and all those things that... Um, just give you a stronger body. Yeah, uh, just kind of foundational strength training sounds like. Yeah, and I, like the the, I feel like the core, um, like my core is really strong, and that's helped me with you know, uh, with horseback uh, equestrian pursuits and stuff. I, um, and and it's helped me you know bounce back from injuries when I you know, when you fall off a horse, you, you tend to get a little banged up. So. Yeah, well, the core strength definitely translates to pretty much whatever sport or athletic thing you want to do yeah um, and i know for myself like i i'm in my late 20s and i i never really liked running um i did play soccer which is but i, I played defense which is i stopped the guys that like to sprint indefinitely and kick the ball back up to them to play around with <laughs> so uh -huh. it's more of the short bursts um and then like a couple of years ago i started with I liked um, the upright bike for doing like interval stuff. Uh, I've done sprinting interval stuff and that I think helps with brain engagement, but we're getting away from diabetes a little bit. Um, <laughs> well, I, I guess, and I, I always bring up exercise right away in a conversation about diabetes because right. I just, I, I'm, I'm critical of the defeatist attitude on on the part of, to a certain extent, the medical community. I I just wish uh, doctors, particularly endocrinologists who deal with type one diabetes, and, and I don't know, maybe you know, I, I don't know, I don't know what they encounter with their patients, but I just feel like they should be more emphatic. Um, even my doctor, when I was a kid, when I was diagnosed, you know. He, he talked about how important it was to exercise, but I don't feel like um, I don't feel like he emphasized it enough. I I I took the initiative entirely on my own based on the fear that I developed over all the reading I did about what can happen to you with type one diabetes. So um, for sure, and and I don't you know the, the fear was the motivator for me. I know that doesn't work with everybody, but um, I I just. You know, you can have a really uh, good quality um, of life. Yeah, and and healthy. Um, you know, I, I I was saying to you before you started recording. I mean, I, yeah, I don't. Um, th there are a lot of younger people than me who don't have type one diabetes who couldn't possibly keep up with me. I'm, um, you know, I'm I'm at a point now where I do I do two a days. I I, I get up in the morning and do a half hour to an hour of cardio. And then when I finish work at 11 o'clock at night, I go to the gym and do another half hour of cardio and I do my strength training. So, um, and you know, that, that just, you know, the, the benefits of that are so, you know, it lowers your blood sugar. Um, it, it increases the effectiveness of the insulin that you have in your system. Right. Um, it diminishes the, the need for insulin, um, which, as you know, is like three hundred dollars a bottle now, um, yeah. and um, so it's you know the, the benefits just it's a it's the opposite of a vicious cycle. The benefits of exercise just um, make everything uh, improve everything. So yeah, well, and it's like it's interesting just diet, exercise, and eating healthy, like solves so many problems but it seems like if it's not a magic pill people don't want to do it yeah 
And I, I have to admit, I mean, I, I talk about exercise. Um, I, I, I am aware that um, I, I don't eat, um, I don't eat the healthiest of diets. But one of the things I've learned is um, because of, of the outsized amount of exercise I get, my default position is actually to get underweight. Um, so, um, you know, I, I eat a lot of carbohydrates. I eat a, I eat a, a fair amount of fat too, um, you know, but balanced with all the exercise I get, you know, my cholesterol numbers are fantastic. My triglyceride numbers are fantastic. And yeah, you know, I, I'm a type one diabetic. I'm the only type one diabetic in my family. Um, but I'm also the only, uh, the only one of my, uh, siblings who, who doesn't have a battle with cholesterol. So, yeah. And I'm hoping I, with me getting into fitness, I can kind of be the, the break in the chain in my family <laughs> to kind of pass that down the line. <laughs> but, mm -hmm. um, so let's, let's talk about like, what, talk about like early on with the learning curve of managing your blood sugar. Was it tedious, frustrating kind of stuff? It was, yes, it was. Um, it, I went through a period of, of, I don't know, denial. Um, and when I first got on insulin, I went through what they call a honeymoon period where it got to the point, you know, my body, I think was so relieved by having the help of the insulin um, that it, it almost like it restarted my pancreas for a while. Hmm. Uh, so that was, and so I, I got to a point in the first year of my, of my diagnosis where I stopped taking insulin uh, because for whatever reason, and you know, in retrospect, I think that that honeymoon thing, um, um, I, I think the insulin, you, you know, your, your pancreas hasn't been completely shut down yet. And so you're, you're taking insulin, giving it some help and, and whatever sort of protective properties um, from the attack on the pancreas, the insulin provides. Um, but that was almost more difficult because then, then I was really disappointed when it became apparent that I really needed insulin again. And I made that decision myself. Um, and that was the thing early on. I was making all the decisions myself. I was trying all kinds of nonsense. I, I went on a low fat diet because I was confusing the, uh, just reading stuff in, in popular, um, in the popular press. I was completely confusing type one and type two diabetes. Um, and, you know, they talk about with type two diabetes, when you cut down on your intake of fat and cut down on your intake of carbohydrates and get exercise, um, you, you don't, you know, you don't even have the disease anymore. So I was kind of working on that. And I went on a low fat diet. Um, and actually the low fat diet is super, it really increased the, uh, the, my sensitivity to insulin. Um, and yeah, it's going to because carbohydrates are easily converted to glucose, which is your, your energy. So, and when you have fat in your food, that slows down your digestion. So when you eat more just carbs, it's going to cause that spike a lot earlier, but then it also gets processed. So you're, it's a short term thing. Well, um, so, you know, there was a lot of experimenting on my part. And, um, and like I say, uh, I, uh, I, an unwillingness to accept my diagnosis, um, you know, but again, that was balanced by the fact that I was exercising. Um, yeah. And, and, and like in, at that age, in my, like in my early twenties and stuff, I, I would go to class, um, in the mornings, I tried to get morning classes in college and I'd go out in the afternoon and not run three miles or four miles. I'd go out and run 13 miles. Um, and I, I would do that multiple times during the week. So, um, and I think there's a limit to how much, how much damage, you know, and I, I don't know, the medical community might dispute me on this, but how much damage you can do to your body with high blood sugar uh, when you're in that kind of, of shape. Um, and, but, you know, I, you know, I, I went through, you know, 
I, I'm sure during those early years of diabetes, I'm sure I was having really high blood sugar, but the fact that I was in otherwise good physical condition, it enabled me to tolerate the high blood sugar, I think. Um, yeah. And, um, and I perhaps did less, less long-term damage than I might otherwise have done. Um, and then, um, you know, I, I, I kind of evolved. I mean, I was taking at that point, I was taking one shot of NPH insulin a day because that's what my pediatrician who had diagnosed me, you know, said was the, 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 the standard thing, you know, but that NPH insulin has a particular peak and it's probably like six or seven hours after you take the shot. Uh, the medical community might tell me, no, you're way off on the hours, but it, there's one peak. Um, and so I would end up like every day with like a lunchtime low blood sugar episode. Not rarely was it anything like debilitating. Um, and again, I think because I was in good physical condition otherwise, but um, you know, so it, you know, as, as time went on, I started to learn. Uh, I think I was early in my television career when I started to take uh, multiple shots. So I was in my mid twenties uh, and I would take that one shot of NPH and then I'd supplement it throughout the day with additional shots of regular insulin at meal times, and that 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 worked that worked pretty well for me. Except um, I put on weight um, because uh, I, I got into this routine of of solving the blood sugar problem entirely with insulin rather than exercise. So I had to I had to drop that back because um, you know I. I've had a I've had a 31 or a 32 inch waist my entire adult life, but uh, during that little period, uh, I got I got kind of fat in my jeans, and I had to uh, I I think I got up to like a 34, and I was like, oh my god, so yeah, because you still was, have the uh, was it a high school graduation jacket that you use on air sometimes? Oh yeah, I still got a, I have a Harris Tweed that was uh, <laughs> given to me by my parents as a high school graduation present. Um, and uh, you know, it, it's it's in style again now. You know, the, yeah. the lapels are kind of perfect for for what guys are wearing. Um, but it's gone up and down. But I've always been able to. It's it never didn't fit me. So that was never that was never the issue. Uh, so, but um, um, but in terms of the education, you know that that um, uh, you know, going to the multiple shots was helpful, and then um. I remember when I was doing a theatrical production, uh, I was working days in Raleigh, Durham and doing a theatrical production at night. Um, and that was when I went on the uh, ultra lenti insulin program, which is a lot like the insulin pump, a single shot of long acting insulin, like 20 units that takes care of your basal insulin needs. And then counting carbohydrates and taking an appropriate amount of regular insulin with every meal that involves carbohydrates. Um, and, and then it was, and, and that went pretty well for me for a long time. What, you know, that, the trick there is learning the right equation, the amount of insulin to take for, for carbohydrates. Um, and I think at that time I was probably taking a little too much. I was taking one unit of regular insulin for 10 grams of carbohydrate. Um, and, um, so I was ending up with low blood sugar episodes. Um, and, um, but I got the education I needed so that um, years later, when I got to Philadelphia, uh, a doctor finally convinced me to go on the insulin pump. Um, of course, back then the insulin pump, you know, really up until very recently, you made all your own decisions with the insulin pump. You set the basal pattern. It would give you a set amount of insulin every hour to take care of your basal needs. And then you would bolus, you know, push a couple of buttons uh, to take um, um, insulin at meal times. Um, and then, um, but now, now I've got this Medtronic insulin pump uh, I've got a sensor attached to me uh, all but like one night a week when it's charging and it actually doesn't even have to charge all night. Um, and it actually makes its own decisions about my basal pattern. It, it, it knows what my blood sugar is and then gives me insulin to, to, to lower the blood sugar or scales back the insulin if I'm, if I'm getting low. Uh, and then, and then I make decisions at mealtime. Um, 
but it's, um, you know, and I, I've had these sensors for, for a few years now, but, but this newest model, uh, 770G, I think it is, is, um, it's really smart. And, um, yeah. I've gotten, I've gotten very, I've gotten very comfortable and used to it. And, um, so is there an age or a time where you felt like you kind of got a handle on it and it just kind of became part of the routine? Um, I feel like it's always been sort of an ongoing chemistry experiment, but. Um, okay. So uh, ongoing challenges. I, I think I really tightened up my control probably in my thirties. Um, but um, where, you know, and part of that was, um, getting more reasonable about, about exercise. Um, you know, it's at some point I realized that it, it, I didn't need to go out and run 13 miles. I really only needed to go out and get my heart rate up for 20 minutes. And I have all the same benefits without the toll on my knees and everything else. And, mm -hmm. and you your lower back and you're just banging on your body that much. Um, but um, I say that of course now I'm, you know, now I'm 60 years old and doing two a days like a lunatic again. So, but, but I'm not, I'm not banging my body. I'm, I think I'm building yeah. my body up and, and strengthening my body in a positive way. So for sure. Yeah. And it's, it's two 30 to 60 minute sessions instead of 13 mile runs or whatever. So, um, so what about like, how have the challenges like changed over the couple of decades you've been dealing with this? Cause when I was reading about it, like there's a lot of factors besides food. So there's like stress and temperature and sleep and sickness. And since it is an autoimmune disorder too, like. Yeah. Um, and I, I, I don't know. I think in a lot of ways I've been blessed because um, I do notice stress, um, stress raising my blood sugar. Um, and that's what's so great about the technology now because um, like in the afternoon in the newsroom when I'm reading scripts and in a rush to get my own story finished, but I'm also reading three other reporters' stories. Um, um, that prior to this version of the insulin pump could have resulted in a spike in my blood sugar. But now I, I look at the pump and I can, eat, I can see when it's giving me more insulin and I get these little like little kind of blue, blue dots along the, my timeline. And I know it's stepped up the insulin uh, it's giving me just like my body would do in a period of stress. And, um, and I, don't have, I don't have the spike. Um, so that, you know, everything, the, the home glucose testing and the insulin pump and then the smart insulin pumps that we have now, all of those things have, um, you know, at, at whatever point I decided to embrace this technology, all of those things have made my life exponentially easier as I've gotten older. Um, and I'm lucky because, you know, I'm, I'm still around to, um, to, to benefit from, from that technology. I, I mean, when I was diagnosed in 1978, the, the first uh, book that I read, I don't remember what the book was, was that um, with a diagnosis of type one diabetes, I could expect optimistically to live 40 years after diagnosis. Well, I'd, I'd have been gone at 58. So, um, but, and, and you, you know, considering what the, what the protocols and, and, the, and the treatment options were back then, if nothing had improved, you know, that, that wouldn't have been unreal. I would argue that if, with the exercise regimen I've done, I'd still be here anyway, but you know. For sure, but a lot the of people- Technology has been really, really, um, you know, um, and, and this job, you know, I've heard, I, I've known other type one diabetics in our business. Um, I worked with a couple of fellows in Milwaukee and actually more in Milwaukee than anywhere else, a couple of different shops I worked in in Milwaukee. Um, you're talking about you know how challenging it is and um and i've found that the weird shifts you work in television are actually more helpful you know like i've always either worked early mornings or worked the night shift which in both cases gives you a big chunk of the day in order to get you know your physical life together so mm -hmm. you know like like you know i, I won't go into the office you know 
for our television work until early afternoon today. And so I've got time for at least one good, good workout before and a good lunch before I go into work. Um, and, um, and when I worked early mornings, it was the same thing. You know, I, I'd wrap up my day at lunchtime uh, for most people. And then I've got all afternoon and I would go, I'd go right from our studios in Philadelphia to the gym downtown and hang out there for an hour working out. And, um, or I'd go out um, and, uh, and ride my horse. So. Um, yeah. On, I mean, I don't always have the same shift, but like I'll either do uh a substantial workout before or after work, depending on how bad the day was. <laughs> um, but yeah, I definitely I, I agree. That's a nice perk. So, um, so you're talking about technology. There's a story you told me a while ago about um, dog training to sense low blood sugar levels. You want to mm -hmm. do that? Um, and this is fascinating. I mean, you know, I've got this sensor on me now. It's it's about it's about this big, and it's it's uh it's in my leg um, and you know, it's, it sends a signal to the insulin pump to scale back the insulin or speed it up or whatever. Um, that stuff is expensive. I mean, I've got health insurance, so I'm, it's covered, um, but the out-of-pocket expense is still pretty significant. Um, but these dogs, these diabetic alert dogs are trained to alert their owner uh, when their blood sugar is low. And I suspect when they're high too, they, they can smell either way. Um, and I, I honestly, I was, I thought it was pretty cool, but I was, I was skeptical about it. Uh, and I did a story when I was working in the Champlain Valley, my physician there was a type one diabetic, is a type one diabetic himself. And he tries out everything on himself before he prescribes it to his patients because that's, it's just kind of, you know, it's, he's got his own sort of, you know, uh, study group in himself to, to, to test things out on. So he got this diabetic alert dog. His name is Banting, like the inventor of insulin. Um, and Banting, we did a story with him, with my doctor present, where I deliberately crashed my blood sugar. Um, I took more insulin than I needed in order to make my blood sugar go low. And Bantine is so well trained. The first thing he did was he just came over to me and started putting his hand up on my knee. Like, you know, dude, you got to do something here. Your blood sugar's low. Uh, and as we planned to do, I ignored the dog. Uh, and again, my doctor's right there while this is going on. Um, so the dog gets more desperate and he goes, runs into the kitchen. He comes out with orange juice and drops it in my lap. Like drink this orange juice. Now, I don't know. I think it, this was kind of staged in a lot of ways. The doc had had these things available to um, to the dog, but it was still amazing, you know, because the dog's making decisions on his own about this. And then um, I can't remember the order, whether it was the orange juice first or he went and got a blood sugar meter and dropped it in my lap. Like, hey, like, dude, check your blood sugar. Like, this is getting serious. Your blood sugar is dropping. Um, but it was, you know, and then it became barking and just more frantic behavior, you know. And if I, I couldn't imagine really ignoring that dog if I was his partner and and I knew what he was there for. You know, we, we wanted to see how frantic he would get and what his behavior would be um, for the for the television story. But but now in retrospect, I have looked back at my history with dogs, um, and I had a dog you know, named Emma Jo when I was living in Philadelphia. And she would, she would, you know, and it, like I say, I, I, I'm looking at this retrospectively now, but she would beg, like when my blood sugar would get low, um, I, I would snack, you know, and whenever I snacked, I always shared with Emma, whatever it was I was eating, you know, which was probably not the best dog training behavior, but, um, and oftentimes would be something like fig newtons because they bring your blood sugar up quickly, but they don't, they don't they're not like, um, they don't spike the blood sugar like some things do. There's a little bit of, I don't know how healthy they are, but anyway, so I'd eat, and she loved fig newtons. So, so, she, so what I, what I realize now is she would sense when my blood sugar was low and she would start begging like, Hey, you know, your blood sugar is low. We're going to eat something. Come on. Hey. And, 
and I wasn't aware of it at the time, but now I look back on it and she was, she was, her, her sense of smell allowed her to know that I was going to snap, which is, you know, amazing. Um, and the dog I have now spots, he's not, he's not real sensitive to it, but I've noticed, um, he's, he's awakened me at night, um, um, before when, when he's concerned about my blood sugar. So, um, that's really, it's kind of cool, you know, and, and I know he's smart enough if, if I were to, you know, I, I'm sure he would be a good candidate to be a diabetic alert dog with his, uh, with his sensitivity and, and his sense of smell. But that kind of training, I think is, you know, tens of thousands of dollars. Right. Oh, but I was talking about the expense of like sensors and things like that. What Dr. Beach, who was my doctor in the Champlain Valley does is um, he, he'll get, um, he'll get one of these dogs, you know, through charitable efforts and stuff, you know, assigned to a type one diabetic who might not have the health insurance and the means to have the, the technology that I have uh, because the dog um, has only the expenses once it's trained of a dog, you know, dog food and the veterinary care. Um, so, um, so the, the dog actually becomes a an affordable option for somebody who might um, otherwise be, you know, having you know rapid fluctuations in blood sugar. But the dog keeps them, you know, lets them know when they need to take some kind of action. So, right. So, do um, you have thoughts about the the skyrocketing insulin and epipen costs and well, Chuck Grassley's efforts? Um, well, and. Um, I, I think it's, 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 and it's not just insulin. I mean, we've, we've got a problem um, in this country with our prescription drugs overall being, you know, we, we pay so much more in this country than, um, you know, other nations do. And one of the things I, I feel very strongly about is we need uh, for, um, for Medicaid and Medicare to be able to negotiate drug prices. I mean, they're a gigantic entity. Um, so, but, you know, the, the special interest, the, the um, call them, you know, special interest, the lobbyists and, and the money from big pharma have prevented um, Congress from, from taking action. They, they don't want to have, they don't want, you know, the government to have that power. But, you know, it, once, we, once we start to allow, allow that, that negotiation for drug prices, the, the whole equation will be changed. I know there's some movement on Capitol Hill now to make that happen, uh, but um, but you know, I I don't know what when it happened because I remember uh, when I was in my early 20s. I don't even know what kind of health insurance I had. I never even really used it because you know you're you're 20 and you're invincible. But I would just go to the drugstore and just buy a bottle of insulin, and I think it was like 30 bucks or something. You know, it wasn't. Um, it might not even have been that much. And now to know that it's $300, that's nuts. So, right. um, but. So that's about all the, the questions I had. So oh. um, if there's anything you want to plug, like Mullet Kid. <laughs> oh, <laughs> yeah, my son's got his own podcast called Mullet Kid. My son is nine. Uh, he talks hockey, rodeo. Uh, I think he's got football Fridays going on now. Um, it's funny cause, uh, like when I try to interview him for one of my little things that I'm doing, he just clams up and doesn't say a word, but boy, he just looks at the camera now and just gets his own podcast action going. He just, he, he blah, blah, blahs, but, uh, but I'll leave, um, you know, any, I don't know, it, it, you know, as your audience develops, how many type one diabetics are going to be checking this out, but, um, what el whatever else you do wrong. The one thing that is absolutely transformative in the, in the treatment of type one diabetes is exercise. And I, I don't mean once a week, I mean 20 minutes minimum a day and just do it every day. It's just make it part of your routine. When, when uh, um, I, I look back over my life, I, I, even with the injuries and things that I've had uh, you know, breaking ribs, falling off of horses. 
I, I would bet I've missed fewer than 30 days of, of intense cardiovascular exercise. Um, and that has enabled me to, to do a, a, as well as I have in life. So. Yeah, that's, and that's even without type one diabetes, that's good advice. Yeah. So thanks for being on the show. Well, thanks for having me, Alex. <laughs>